Hi, this is Greg from Structural Toolkit, and in this video, we're going to go through how to design a steel column. You can design a steel column using either the steel column or steel member design modules. The steel column design module offers a streamlined method of completing the column design under purely axial and bending as a result of N eccentricity in accordance with the simple construction section of AS4100. Whereas the member design provides a wider range of available design checks and refinements, that the column module does not contain, but will typically require more user input and therefore take longer to perform a design with. Which one you should use will depend on the design situation as each have their own advantages. For example, a steel column in a residential house with pinned connections would likely be more suitable for the steel column module. Whereas a column that forms part of a fixed frame with intermediate restraints, such as a portal frame, would be more appropriate to design with the member design module. As we go through both modules in this video, it should become clear why. For this video, we'll go through a brace steel SHS column design that is pinned top and bottom. We'll have its supporter beam that is cleated to the side of the top of the column, which will imply an eccentric point load at the top. This point load will also create a resultant moment at the top of the column due to the eccentricity. We'll then have our column height be 2.7 meters. Using these design conditions, we'll go through both the steel column and steel member design modules to try and arrive at the same answers, while also highlighting some differences. So the first module we'll go through is the steel column. At the top of this module, we get our geometry. And conveniently enough, our length of 2.7 meters is already in there, which is a common residential height. We then get some inputs relating to the way our column is fixed. To the right, we can alter the design lengths for LX, LY, and LB by changing the input to note. And then input in the different lengths is required. LX and LY refer to our segment length in both the X and Y axis of the member for axial compression design. LB is then our segment length for our member regarding design for bending. Depending on the kinds of restraints you have along your member, these lengths may differ from one another. For our example, we'll just leave this option as yes, as there are no intermediate restraints that prevent buckling about the major or minor axis, therefore these lengths will be the same as our column length. We then have our effective length factors for compression, which comes from figure 4.6.3.2 of the steel code. As we stated at the start of the video, our column is braced and pinned at each end, so we'll leave our effective length factors here as both 1. Then for bending, we have our other effective length factor, coming from clause 5.6.3. For this module, you'll need to calculate it yourself. And for our example, we'll leave it as 1. We'll have a bit more of a look at this factor in the member design module later on, where we will be able to show how we arrive at the value of 1. Finally, we have our moment modification factor, alpha m, which accounts for the non-uniform distribution of a bending moment within a segment, and is used together with alpha s the slenderness reduction factor, to determine the segment's capacity to resist lateral torsional buckling effects. In the case of alpha m, it can range anywhere from 0.25 to 2.5, where one represents a segment with uniform bending moment and restrained both ends, meaning that the compression flange is under uniform stress along the entire segment. The alpha m value used for particular moment shapes within a segment are shown in table 5.6.1 and 5.6.2. For our example, we have a pinned end member with a moment at one end, which will give us 1.75. Next, we have our loading section. As discussed at the start of the video, we have a beam cleated into the side of the column at the top. The design for this beam was completed earlier, being floor beam FB01 in this project, which we can see at the top left here. What we can do in this case is use the linked reaction feature to add the end reaction of FB1 into our loading section. By high loading the two load cells, Deleting the load in there, right clicking, going add reaction, and then selecting our floor beam one, and also the end we want to take it from. In our case, we'll pick the left end. This will then bring in the dead and live loads, and below calculate out our ultimate design axial force, being 31.1 kilonewtons in this case. Another way you might do this on a project with a number of beams is to work out the maximum axial load allowable for a certain column size and then use that column for all beam supports that do not exceed that load. For domestic structures, an effective way is to make the live load the same as the dead load and increase this until you reach the full utilization of the member's capacity. 
But as we're only going to look at one beam support in a column in our case, using the linked reaction approach is going to be more appropriate. To the right, we then have the type of analysis used. Coming from section 4.4 of the code, where we work out our moment amplification and whether we need to consider second order analysis or not. So our type is going to be braced as we discussed earlier. The beta m is the ratio of the smaller and larger bending moments. And given we have zero moment at the bottom and maximum at the top, this will be zero in our case. Based on this, we get a CM value and then a subsequent moment amplification being delta B, which for our column is one. It is only when the column becomes slender that the amplification will have an effect and consideration of beta M becomes more important. As this value does not exceed 1.4, we do not need to consider second order in our case. In the event that this value does exceed 1.4, you'll need to refer to Appendix E for details on performing second order analysis. For users who have access to analysis standard, you can perform a direct second order analysis using the analysis page. But remember to break the column up into segments to allow for the column curvature. Refer to our analysis standard video if you want to find out more. The next part of our loading tab is determining our bending moment, being due to the eccentric reaction from our floor beam. The options we have to determine the moment are based on the simple construction clause of 4.3.4, where a beam reaction is to be taken as a minimum of 100 millimeters away from the face of the column, unless it is a cap connection, where it is then to be taken at the face. This is then the difference between the options cap and face. The manual option allows us to input a manual moment as needed. And finally, the loading option, which relates to the loading tab at the bottom, which we will have a look at later on. So for our example, we have a cleated connection to one side, and so we'll pick the face option. If your connection ends up resulting in a point load greater than 100 millimeters away from the face, or you want to apply a different method of moment determination than cap or face, then you will need to use the manual option. Finally, we then have an input to put a minor axis bending moment as needed. If the cleat were to be offset from the center line of the column, then you would need to include this minor axis moment. We will consider our beam being connected through the center line, so won't need to put anything in here. If you have multiple beams connecting into your column at different sides, you want to have a look at the loading tab, which we will get into shortly, although you could certainly use this input for it. With all our inputs complete, the section below will determine our column's capacities for compression, bending, and combined based on the relevant sections from AS4100. The results from this section are then summarized at the top. And we can see for our default 89 by 3.5 square hollow section, we are comfortably within capacity. Given this, we could reduce the size of our column down to 75 if needed. But for this example, an 89 will be fine as an 89 SHS fits into 90 mil stud work nicely. You may have noticed to the right that we have a couple sections in red, referring to the fact that our column is doubly symmetric and compact, meaning we might be able to achieve a better capacity. This refers to certain formulas for membered capacities under combined moment and axial forces throughout section eight of the code that can be used in lieu of the standard formulas when your section is doubly symmetric and compact with a KF of one. If we want to use these formulas, we'll need to use the member design module, so we'll have a look at it later. Finally, in this module, we have the loading tab down below. You'll generally be wanting to look at this tab if you have multiple beams or point loads loaded onto your column at different sides, and you're wanting to get a more refined look at the kinds of moments you would get by having eccentricities in different directions. On this tab, we have four sets of inputs, with each set representing one side of the column. In each set, you would input your loads, reactions, and type of connection or eccentricity in the same way as the design tab we looked at earlier. In this case, we do get a manual eccentricity input as well. The cases assessed are a combination of the full load, no live load, minimum dead loads of 0.9 on certain sides, and live loads multiplied by the combination psi factor. Details on all of them can be found to the right down the bottom. Once all your loads have been input, you can then find the critical case by using the button to the right here, and then transferring that case to the design tab. This will set the beam end connection type to L for loading, and then input the critical axial loads and moment forces. So, with our steel column design done with this module, we'll now try and replicate this design in the steel member design module.
The first thing we do is select our SHS section. The first input we'll want to deal with for this module is our bending moment input to the right. What's different in this module is we're going to have to work out our ultimate moment ourselves, whereas the steel column module did it for us. Now to remember what our reaction was, we can have a look at our floor beam design. We can see here we have an ultimate reaction force of 31.1 kilonewtons. So going back to our member design, we can use the moment input cell to calculate out what our moment should be. And if we remember, our connection case was 100 millimeters from the face of the column. So our lever arm is going to be half the column width plus 100 millimeters. So in the moment input, we can put 31.1 multiplied by 0.1 plus 0.089 divided by 2 to give us our moment. Our segment length will then be the height of our column being 2700. And our alpha M will be 1.75 as discussed previously. If we click on this alpha M button, we'll be taken to a tab that can be used as a reference for various typical alpha M cases, along with the formulas provided in the code. We can see our case of 1.75 here. And out of interest, if we put our end moments in the straight line formula of table 5.6.1, this also gives us a value of 1.75. Going back to the design tab, we can then look at our effective length factor again for bending. Clicking on the KE button, we are taken to a tab where we can alter how it is calculated. Here we can specify how the module calculates out each K factor that goes into working out the effective length factor. Before we talk about the KE factors though, a SHS is a symmetric section that is not going to be susceptible to lateral buckling. So the selection of restraint conditions are kind of irrelevant. It should be noted that a beam that is bent about the minor axis will not buckle laterally. If you increase the length of the member significantly, you will see that the FMBX will reduce to less than the FMSY. This can be seen as an anomaly due to a simplification of the buckling formulas of the standards. Despite this, we will still look at our restraints. We'll say that our pin steel column is going to be framed into a timber stud wall, and so it will be effectively fully restrained in place each end from twist. So we can leave our ends as F and F. Our load position will be at the end of the member and above the top flange. And finally, our ends are not prevented from rotation, although in actual fact, we would get some inherent resistance from the base fixity of a standard connection. This gives us a KE of one, which is what we used in the steel column module. Going back to the design tab, we can then move on to the compression section. Our major axis lengths will be 2700 and we'll set our member to be braced. Our axial compression is going to be 31.1 kilonewtons, which comes from our floor beam. And our effective length factors are going to be one as we are pinned top and bottom, as we looked at earlier. With those inputs done, we should effectively have the same design as our steel column module. And if we compare the two with the split pane feature, We can see that our axial capacity utilization is 0.13 for both, moment is 0.39 and combined is 0.52. So we've successfully managed to match both designs. As we discussed earlier, our section is doubly symmetric and compact with a KF of one. So there are different formulas we can use from section eight to look at our capacities under combined axial and bending. In our steel member design, we can turn these on with the option to the bottom right here. In our case, we'll find that our capacity utilization for combiners come down from 0.52 to 0.42. To see these formulas in action, we can switch to the combine tab at the bottom and have a look at all the relevant calculations performed. Depending on the type of design you're performing, the steel member design can also do various other checks such as shear or even torsion. With what we've gone through in this video, you should have a fairly good idea of which design module suits which kind of design best, as they each have their own advantages. That about covers all you need to know for completing a steel column design in Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching.